Here is why you cannot exterminate us, Avru AT. We're not huddled in one place. We span the galaxy. We need no lords or leaders, so you cannot destroy our command. We can live without technology, so we can fight with our bare hands. We have no species or bloodline, so we can rebuild our ranks with others who want to join us. We're more than just a people or an army, Avru AT. We're a culture. We're an idea. And you can't kill ideas, but we can certainly kill you. What's up, Meta Nerds? This is essentially a documentary on the Mandalorians, or as they're called in their own language, the Manduade, meaning the children of Mandalore. Like that quote mentions, the Mandalorians aren't a species, but a culture. We'll get into their origins, their history, how they did start as a specific species, but ended up being mostly humans, notable Mandawade across history, and their constant and important role as a third-party wildcard in galactic affairs. Our story starts around 24,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, when the Tong species were entrenched in a war of elimination against the Zell. These Zell are the human natives to Coruscant, and they had been fighting the Tong for centuries. When a volcano erupted and leveled the human's capital, the Tong saw a chance at victory, launching intense raids over the next two years, as Coruscant was plunged into total darkness, the atmosphere full of volcanic ash. The Tong's terrifying raids would be immortalized in a poem that is still known throughout the galaxy, called the Weda Verda, the Warriors of Shadow. The Tong's whole culture revolved around war, with the society being loosely assembled warrior clans that all followed their chieftains. They would give their children names like Atkin, Kot, and Tor, meaning persistent, strength, and justice, while their gods reflected this warlike nature as well. Kod Harangir was a god who used conflict to improve the world. Survival of the fittest both in your own behaviors, your family, but also in the world around you. The idea that competition was a way to accelerate natural selection, and thus war is applied on a massive scale, eventually a galactic scale. Note that in this, there is no concept of morality as we would conceive of it on Earth. With them, surviving is equated with improving, and that process is a good in of itself. Conquering in this culture has the equivalence of happiness or well-being in most Earth cultures, things that philosophically and religiously are usually considered to be goods in themselves. We don't ask why someone would prefer to be happy. Likewise, the Tong would have not understood why they had to explain why combat was preferable to peace. And further to this point, the opposing god in their duality is not a devil that corrupts or wants to spread misery. The Tong god that needs to be resisted was Arasum a sloth god who tempted those to live a life of stagnation and idleness. If the Sith mantra reads, peace is a lie, you could think of these early Mandalorians as believing that peace is a sin. This was enshrined in a body of text called the Canons of Honor, which had within it the Resulnare, meaning the six actions, as well as commentaries from wise Tong chieftains. A notable quote reads, I adhere to the Resulnare, the core of what it means to be Mandalorian, the sacred law giving us direction and purpose. Education and armor, self-defense, our tribe, our language, our leader, all help us survive. We must educate our children as Mandalorians, obey the commands of Mandalore, speak Mandoa, and defend our clans. Here is where the Mandalorian armor was enshrined as something to keep holy, and forever tied to being one of the Mandoade, symbolizing the keeping of these virtues. The Tong armor had this metal helmet that was form-fitting upon their triangular heads, and you can see how this early armor that accommodated the room for the eyes, and their pointed jaws, remained a look in the helmets even as it changed over tens of thousands of years. But despite this warring culture, the original human Coruscanti simply outnumbered the Shadow Warriors, and they were eventually able to push the Tong off their homeworld. At this point, there is a split, where a peace-loving sect of priestly female Tong fled Coruscant for the Unknown Regions but the majority of them went to the planet Rune in the Outer Rim. This was the darkest moment in the history of Mandalorian culture, literally due to the so-called Cloak of the Sith, a thick layer of cosmic dust that shrouded this planet, but also because they would stay here wallowing in obscurity and weakness for about 17,000 years. The year 7000 BBY would see the rise of Tesolek Mandalore, or Mandalore the First. The first to use the title Soul Ruler, translated to Mandalore. He would become the chief of all chieftains, and form the Mandalorian Crusaders, a force that spread out conquering world after world in the Outer Rim. They eventually came across a planet in Sector 07 that had plenty of fresh water and farmable land, but also an incredibly unique material called Beskar. This form of iron ore contained elements that could withstand multiple blows from lightsabers, and yet was malleable enough to be crafted into armor. 
It seemed the war god had blessed their return to conquering, with this perfect world to become the capital of the Mandalore Empire. And it was thus named Mandalore. The only problem was the native population. The Mythosaurs were enormous beasts that ruled this world. Creatures that would scare away most other settlers were instead seen by the Mandalorians as proof that this world was reserved for the ultimate warriors. Mandalore I and his crusaders extincted the Mythosaur and left their bones out in the open for all to see how large and numerous their foes were. The creature's skull would become synonymous with the strength of the Mandalorians and would become one of the most well-known and respected sigils across the galaxy for thousands of years to come. Over the next 3,000 years, they consolidated their new territory in the Outer Rim, spreading out from Mandalore to capture nearby Ordo, Gargon, and Shogun, while also developing Mandalore's moon, Concordia. But during this time, they were undergoing a sort of religious revolution over these thousands of years of fighting. It came about that the Mandalores saw the old god Cad Harangir as not a true and separate entity that needed to be worshipped with special rites developed for him. This was in a way a form of idolatry, worshipping a construct instead of the act of war itself. It wasn't this god, but the whole universe that was created and developed by the act of dominating. The microscopic organism with a slight advantage over its competitors devours them. The forming of planets is a process of absorbing your neighboring space debris to make yourself larger. The black hole devours light itself, and yet still can be swallowed up by a larger black hole. The powerful conquering is a law of the universe. Therefore, the rituals to Cad Harangir were a distraction from this universal presence, the sort of will that is present everywhere and in all things. And so they realized that anyone who wages war itself was in tune with this divine plan. That combat was the one and only true form of worship. Not to some old god, but you personally were carrying out the divine will. And thus, in that moment, you yourself are divine. Not only is this more sophisticated metaphysics, but it's a great way to rally up some more crusaders. With this mindset, they would carry on fighting and taking over, but interestingly, this is where we also see a non-Tong species brought into the Mandalorian fold. The first ever non-Tong Mandos were the Mandalian Giants. They were able to repel the Mandalorians, but loved the warrior culture so much that they adopted their culture. We're now in the year 4000 BBY, where the Crusaders were busy extincting the Navuta species. But they did absorb many Escaloni slaves, but also destroyed the Noble Basilisk. These were highly intelligent dragon-like species, and this conflict would be the first time that Mandalorians faced off against Jedi. The Order sent over some relief, but even this combined force could not stand up to the Crusaders. The Basilisks poisoned their own world to deny it to the Conquerors, but some were taken as slaves, while their machines, the Basilisk war droids, were captured and would become a staple of the Crusader military. From here, they launched an attack into the Deep Core, into the unstable Empress Teta system. They conquered a few worlds, which got the attention of Jedi Knight-turned-Sith warlord, Ulic Keldroma. Mandalore the Indomitable challenged him to a duel, where despite his war droid and Beskar armor, he was defeated and swore allegiance to Keldroma and his Sith master, Exar Kun. This marked the first Mandalorian-Sith alliance. This was during an event called the First Sith War, also known as the Great Shadow Crusade to the Mandalorian people, which was fought in a single year, 3996 BBY. This new alliance launched a daring raid on the Republic shipyards over Forost. Here they attained as much as 300 starships. With this flotilla, they went directly to the Republic's capital, attacking the home of the original Mandalorians, Coruscant. They poured into Galactic City, but were betrayed by their allies, the Krath Witch Alimo Kido. She also abandoned Keldromo to the Jedi forces. Mandalore the Indomitable was able to escape and made it to Exar Kun on Yavin 4. Explaining the situation, the pair teamed up and personally raided the Senate building and rescued Droma. The Witch was dispatched by the trio, and they decided to abandon Coruscant for now. Later attacks brought the Besilisk war droids up against the Beast Riders and Drexels on Onderon, as they attempted to take the capital city of Isis. Onderon's moon, Daxon, has an orbit that places the two temporarily in each other's atmosphere, which allowed the Indomitable to flee when the Republic forces responded to invasion. His mount was shot down, and he plummeted into the thick jungle of this moon. Here, a swarm of beasts devoured the Indomitable. He had led the Mandalorians for so long that his distinct helmet became a symbol of the sole ruler. Without a Mandalore, many of the clans started to fracture, but the helmet was discovered by a Tong who had lived through that battle. He removed it and declared himself Mandalore the Ultimate. He realized that his people had been dragged into the witch's machinations. 
and vowed to restore the Mandalorians to the great warrior status they once held. On the planet Shogun, which years earlier had shown the Indomitable that the old gods were false, now gave Mandalore the Ultimate a vision of the Tong species going extinct. At this time, the Tong species made up the bulk of Mandalorians, and it was them that kept hurling themselves at the Republic and the Jedi. But he knew that the Mandalorian values were not bound to the Tong species, and so he formed the Neo Crusaders. He traveled the galaxy giving rousing speeches to those willing to embrace the martial principles. Humans were the most populous and widespread species in the galaxy, and this is why the majority of these new Mandalorians were human. But there were also tons of Rhodians, Twi'leks, Tagorians, and Karestians. From this moment on, the term Mandalorian really started to become untied to the Tong species. Now it was more about the culture. About 20 years after the previous war, now 3,978 BBY, a pureblood Sith species contacted Mandalore the Ultimate and enticed him to search Sith ruins for insight into the future. This Sith was working for the mysterious Sith Emperor and used his powers in the Force to instill visions of Mandalorians conquering the Republic. Inspired by promises of victory, the Neo Crusaders started to capture neutral territory, and in 10 years they controlled a larger area than all of the Hut clans. The Ultimate appointed a man named Cassus Fett to be the top military strategist, and he promptly accelerated the capture of more worlds. One of Fett's contributions was the standardization of armor, something that helped to create a more cohesive identity across the diverse species, and ensured that the galaxy at large knew when they were dealing with a Mandalorian. He also developed a dual-pronged economic assault, in which these captured neutral worlds deprived the Republic of imports, while the Mandalorians took the local population as slave labor, and focused all of these planets' resources to the sole task of creating more weapons and ships for the eventual war with the Republic. This caused an inpouring of refugees that caused internal strife and economic pressures, compounding the weakness of losing these neutral worlds. Senators said that the Republic would only intervene if directly attacked, and all this time the Ultimate had set up training grounds deep in the jungle of Daxon. The place where his predecessor had been devoured, these camps were one of the greatest embodiments of their culture, training against the very creatures that had felled their leader, lifting up the rank and file to a greater strength than the best among them from just a generation before. In 3964, they sprang up from the secret camp and took Onderon, Vanquo, and Taurus in a shocking blitzkrieg. Two Jedi named Revan and Malak became aware of some of the Mandalorian atrocities some of which included the nuclear bombardments of entire worlds. These two Jedi refused to stand by, eventually leading Republic forces and pushing the Mandalorians back. He came across the helmet of a Mandalorian woman who opposed Fett's genocide, and upon donning it, he sweared that he would not rest until the Mandalorians had been completely defeated. Revan's strategy worked to pull most of the Mandalorian forces to Malachor V. Here, the Jedi leader had to draw on this world's immense dark side energy in order to defeat Mandalore the Ultimate in a duel. After this, he activated the Mass Shadow Generator, which destroyed most of the Mandalorian fleets. Without their leader or a proper navy, they signed a peace treaty with the Republic. Malak worried about a rise of the Mandalorians, but Revan said simply, Without the mask, they are nothing. A cold statement where he is acknowledging that he is destroying an entire culture simply by holding on to this mask depriving them of a leader, which will just lead to fracturing and infighting that will eventually erase the Mandalorian identity from history. The Republic destroyed most of their military infrastructure and completely eliminated the iconic Besilisk war droids. This one's proud people tried to keep up their traditions, but were spread out across the galaxy and often resorted to taking up odd jobs as hired guns. These informal groupings became known as the Mandalorian Mercs with notable individuals like Gorse Bendak achieving gladiatorial fame on Taurus and Geonosis, and Candorus Ordo becoming one of the most infamous mercs in the galaxy. But as the Force would have it, he crossed paths with Revan, who now understood that the Mandalorians were being manipulated into war by the hidden Sith Emperor. Revan gave the helmet to Ordo, and asked him to rebuild the Mandalorians into a proud people. He took the name Mandalore the Preserver, he met with what may have been the final remaining Tong in the galaxy. This being was dying, but explained that he was the rightful heir to Mandalore the Indomitable, that the Ultimate had used his Sith backing to take over. He begged that Ordo take his armor and reinstill some of the virtues from the Canons of Honor. Ordo would be the first non-Tong Mandalore, and he went back to their roots, growing a new following of Neo Crusaders on the outpost of Daxon. These forces would go on to fight against the Sith Triumvirate, help the Onderon royal family, and even provide aid to the Republic. 
Mandalore the Preserver personally aided the raid on Darth Nihilus' flagship, even providing the explosives that were used to blow it into space dust. The next 300 years of Mandalorian history is a bit foggy, but it is clear that Clan Ordo did not fully unify the Mandalorians. In 3661 BBY, the Sith Empire made a surprise return to the galaxy, and looked for another Mandalorian puppet. In the gladiator pits of Geonosis, there was a crowd favorite. It was the perfect combination of charismatic and dumb, so Imperial Intelligence agents had the fights fixed, and had plants in the crowd that started chanting Mandalore upon each of his victories. This man seemed invincible, and many of the diaspora were happy to call him their new leader. The Sith revealed themselves as allies, and convinced him that it was in Mandalore's interest to blockade the Hydean Way, cutting off a major Republic supply line as the Empire expanded in the Outer Rim. Mandalorian cruisers were too powerful for a straight-up attack, so the Republic had to rely on blockade-breaking smugglers. To rally up his supporters, this puppet Mandalore announced the Great Hunt on Daxon to determine who would become his best warrior. Artis kept winning the trials, and in line with the old true virtues, challenged Mandalore to a duel in the gladiator pits on Geonosis. This propped up leader was slaughtered, and Artis took the name Mandalore the Vindicated. His predecessor is only known in the history books as an insult, Mandalore the Lesser. He was much more cautious of his Sith allies, but knew that the money and weapons allowed him to consolidate power. But again, not all respected the centralized leader. In splinter groups like Clan Varad and the Terror Brigade launched attacks against both the Sith and the Republic. The Vindicated would be eliminated during the rise of the Eternal Empire, being killed by a swarm of Sky Troopers. Death by Droid was seen as immensely dishonorable, and this whole conflict created a strong anti-Droid sentiment that would stick in Mandalorian culture from here on out. Como Fett could have chosen to take on the mantle, but he didn't want the responsibility, so instead the infamous bounty hunter Shea Vizsla became Mandalore the Avenger. Previously, she had been allied to Darth Malgus, and assisted him in battles on Alderaan, and even against the Jedi Temple itself. Now she would join the Outlander and the Alliance, a combination of Sith and Republic forces that realized how grievous a threat the organic-hating Gemini droids posed to the galaxy. After this ancient, eternal force was destroyed, there was relative peace for the next thousand plus years. That is, until the new Sith Wars, spanning from 2000 BBY to 1000. This conflict had the Mandalorians fighting against their once allies, the Sith Empire. The reasons behind this are still shrouded in mystery, but everything points to the exchange of a lot of credits, supporting a constant complaint by Mandalorians of this era, that their once righteous, holy crusades of violence in accordance with the laws of the universe had been forgotten. Now it was all just for treasure. Around this time is where we also get Mandalorian training master Chang raising a Jedi named Dirge. He adopted this odd creature and raised it in the ways of the Mandalorians, but eventually he abandoned the culture when he felt that they were merely hired guns. The pair were taken in by a cyberneticist, who enhanced their strength and longevity in exchange for protection from the current Mandalore. During a raid on the lab, all were killed but Dirge who was able to massacre the attackers, and devoted his life to killing Mandalorians. Darth Bane would bring an end to the Sith Empire in the year 1000 BBY, and apparently in order to ensure galactic peace, the Republic turned on the Mandalorians in 738 BBY. As the Warlords were still not fully under the control of the Mandalore, the Republic invaded Mandalore itself. Infighting against rival clans allowed the Republic a total victory, with weapons used by both the Republic and the Mandalorians creating an enormous cataclysm, an environmental disaster that turned much of this rich world into the barren white sand deserts that now cover its surface. This is where we get the New Mandalorians, a faction with very contentious origins. Many believe that they were propped up by the Republic to coax them into abandoning their culture. The New Mandalorians said that the Canons of Honor only lead to death and ruin that strength could only come by working together, by peacefully partaking in the Republic system. What I find interesting is that many Jedi were said to be leading the assault, and the Darksaber may have been stolen by the Jedi Temple around 1000 BBY. The lore on the Darksaber is not clear, simply stating that it was stolen during the fall of the Old Republic. It is said to be around a millennia before the Clone Wars, which would have been when the Republic was heavily involved in the Sith Wars. Tare Vizsla, descendant of Mandalore the Avenger Shea Vizsla, was the only Mandalorian to become a Jedi. He was able to temporarily unify his people, and so the Darksaber became the new sign of the Soul Ruler, replacing the role of the Helmet. The total destruction of Mandalore is not a story the Republic would tell you, but they and the Jedi definitely played a role. 
it wasn't solely the result of a civil war amongst clans. But whatever you think of that, it worked, and these were now a pacifist people, devoting all of their energy to surviving in the domed cube cities. Their capital was Sundari, and the leaders came to take the names from other cultures, like King, Queen, and Duchess, no longer calling themselves the Mandalore. Those unable to give up the warrior code were sent to the Moon Concordia, and the sight of armor-wearing Mandalorians became incredibly rare on Mandalore. These few called themselves the Akali, or Faithful, and they did keep a leader that they called Mandalore, with the last named one being a genocidal maniac named Mandalore the Destroyer. He took over after his predecessor was killed by Dirge, still carrying out murderous raids against Mandos in the year 100 BBY. Around 60 BBY, just 28 years before the Battle of Naboo, the Mandalorian Civil War erupted. Those calling themselves the True Mandalorians were living by what they called the Super Commando Codex, a sort of revised chivalry which stated that it is still noble and morally necessary to learn the martial arts, but that these skills should not be used to conquer in the old survival of the fittest framework. Instead, they are for protecting the rights of individuals. But Tor Vizsla hated this bastard child of the new pacifists and old martial ideas. He formed a group called Death Watch, and waged war on the Super Commandos. Jaster Mareel was the leader of these true Mandalorians, and eventually he and his forces were pushed off of Mandalore to the agricultural world of Concord Dawn. The local police force had a position called the Journeyman Protector, and one of them allowed the true Mandalorian forces to hide out on his property, and so they set up camp at the Fett Farm. Vizsla found out that this man was hiding Mareel, and brutally interrogated him in front of the man's son. Mama Fett sprung up out of hiding, and unloaded her blaster rifle into Death Watch troops. She was killed in the fighting, and his father ordered the son to run into the fields. This eight-year-old Django Fett was picked up by Mareel, who raised the boy as his own, teaching him the new ways of the Mandalorians. The fighting between these two factions would continue, spanning nearly two decades, and it also saw a 14-year-old Django Fett hold his dying adopted father in his arms, succumbing to wounds delivered by Vizsla. Django was now considered the Mandalore, and they started to score significant victories in 44 BBY. But Vizsla and Death Watch turned to political corruption when they couldn't win on the battlefront. They contacted the governor of Galadran, and concocted a story of war crimes committed by the true Mandalorian forces. The Jedi Order gets involved, and believed the claims that Fett's forces were killing political activists, including innocent women and children. Count Dooku led a strike team to capture Fett, hoping to get to the bottom of these claims. But the Mandalore refused to be brought in on false claims. He knew that if he was removed for trial, Death Watch would certainly regain their strength. So Fett and the true Mandos opened fire. The shootout resulted in 11 dead Jedi, six of which were shot by Jango personally, but all of his forces were cut down. Fett was indeed captured, and turned over to the corrupt Galadran governor, who in turn sold him into slavery. But you don't get the reputation for being a galactic badass on your looks alone. Django was able to escape, break into the governor's office, and steal back his trophy armor, and then track down and kill Vizsla. Seeing that both the local governments and even the Jedi Order could be so easily manipulated by evil, and also being hardened by the war and life as a slave, Django Fett dedicated his life to being a bounty hunter, and on his armor he would proudly bear his adopted father's sigil. He never did forgive the Jedi Order, but ironically he would become allied to the Jedi that led that strike team that forever changed his life. The Mandalorian Civil War was terrible for the individuals that directly experienced it, but it was a relatively small conflict, mostly only affecting Mandalore itself, and a few of its neighboring worlds. Even the amount of those involved was a great minority of the population, which helped the pacifist movement even more. Now is when Duchess Satine comes to power, pushing a pacifist agenda even further, about 20 years before the opening of the Clone Wars. In 32 BBY, the bounty hunting Jango was approached by Darth Tyrannus to create a clone army. It is unclear if this fallen Jedi used the promise of Order 66 to entice Jango, whether or not he knew that his clones would be used to take down his enemies in the Jedi Order. But either way, the Kaminoans brought him in not just for genetic donation, but also for hands-on training, and even the designing of these troops' armor. This is why clone troopers have a similar T-visor appearance. Fett personally trained the first batch of Alpha-class ARC troopers, instilling Mandalorian traditions, and even ensuring that they memorized the song Vodeon, meaning brothers all. 
an ancient chant sung in the Mandoa language, and which mentions that they are the wrath of Coruscant. Gives it a nice dual meaning given how the clones were used by the Republic, and that Coruscant is the original homeworld of the Tong species. Then Django established the Koi Valdar, a group of 100 sergeants, 75 of which were Mandalorians. Members like Cal Scarada helped to infuse Mandalorian culture even further, though Palpatine would take measures to phase out these Mandalorian-trained clones, with later batches not receiving this rich cultural tradition. Back on Mandalore, Satine vowed to keep neutral during the Clone Wars, but Death Watch sought out Dooku as an ally. They attacked a Republic cruiser, and spread rumors on Confederate worlds that the new Mandalorians were actually supporting the Republic. This is why Obi-Wan was dispatched to meet with Satine, a woman that he came to love after being assigned to protect her in the final months of the Civil War. Remember that Mandalore's Moon Concordia was the exile place for all the old Mandalorians, those trying to keep up the war-loving traditions. It was governed by Pre Vizsla, who was secretly supporting the production of weapons, jetpacks, and full suits of armor, all for the purposes of overthrowing the pacifists. This sparked a really controversial move by the Republic, who after learning that Death Watch now had such growth and backing, sent a large peacekeeping force. Many Mandalorians opposed this, seeing it as occupation, and proof that the Republic still believed that the Mandalorians were too dangerous and unpredictable to rule themselves. This brought more traitors out of the shadows, like Senator Merrick, who was thought to be one of the Duchess's most trusted allies. His scheme would mark the start of several assassination attempts, while Dooku started giving more and more support to Death Watch, even offering to provide Mandalorian people with CIS droids to protect them from the unwanted Republic clones. And then it seemed like her deputy Prime Minister Jarek turned on her, calling for more Republic aid and claiming that this new civil war was due to her weak leadership. But this was in fact a holovid deepfake, and though Jarek was assassinated, his true message was revealed saying that the Mandalorians themselves could fight Death Watch without Republic aid. But there was a parting, nasty little move by the Republic. Seen as a tumultuous world, Republic trade was banned from traveling through Mandalorian space. This worked to grow a black market, set up in part by the Duchess's closest ally, Prime Minister Almec. A man who betrayed the Duchess simply because he didn't want to give up some of the imports that he loved. This decadence is a long way from the Spartan living of the earlier Mandos and this seed of corruption spread throughout the police force, and even the new Mandalorian Secret Service. Almec attempted to have Satine framed, but it backfired and he ended up imprisoned. By 20 BBY, Death Watch had a falling out with Dooku, seeing that he was just keeping up with the long tradition of Sith that just use the Mandalorians, and don't actually care about the fate of Mandalore. Lux Bonteri hoped to use their aid to help him avenge his mother, a peace-wanting Separatist leader that had been killed by Dooku. Lux and Ahsoka were met by Bo-Katan and Pre Vizsla, but they were unwilling to stand by as Death Watch committed atrocities, so the plan fell apart, but they do escape. Here, Death Watch found a new ally, who hated both the Republic and the Sith-led CIS. Darth Maul had been growing a criminal empire known as the Shadow Collective. By sending hordes of criminals to invade the capital, they were able to make Death Watch appear like the heroes. Pre Vizsla publicly confronts the team and has her arrested. Vizsla would be the new Prime Minister of Mandalore, but not for long. Darth Maul knew his Mandalorian culture, and if Vizsla was going to usher back the old customs, he could not be seen to turn down a challenge to a duel. The fighting was intense, but Maul would win the battle and proclaim himself the new Mandalore. Bo-Katan and the Night Owls refused to submit, and so had to fight against Death Watch. Just layers of civil wars here. She was actually Satine's sister, and would come back to help Obi-Wan escape Maul's capture but only after Maul used Satine to deal one of the hardest losses that Kenobi would ever experience, coldly killing the Duchess in front of him just to make his oldest enemy suffer. Things were so out of control that Sidious personally visits Mandalore. He cut down Maul's brother, then defeats Maul and takes him prisoner. It should be pointed out that throughout this incredibly volatile time, you can see that even the pacifists had Mandalorian artwork that was embracing their past as warriors with visions of the Crusaders, and even vanquished Jedi. Before he was captured, Maul had put Prime Minister Almec in as his puppet leader, and he would continue ruling while the Zabrak was imprisoned at Stygium Prime. The Maul DeLoreans, the super commandos still loyal to him, freed Maul, and they returned to Mandalore. Due to the encouraging of Bo-Katan and Obi-Wan's personal testimony, the Republic agreed to siege Mandalore and take it out of the hands of a known Sith-trained crime warlord. If they were worried about the planet before, it doesn't get much worse than that. Ahsoka Tano had left the Jedi Order at this point, but she returned to lead a detachment of clone troopers during the siege. 
She confronts Maul and gets in one of the best barbs in galactic history. Here's a snippet of the conversation. Maul says, It was so nice of your former masters to send you alone and spare me the exertion of a proper fight. You're not even a real Jedi. Ahsoka says, It'll be a fair fight then. You're only half a Sith. Pretty great stuff. Tano was able to draw Maul into a ray shield trap, but as his forces come to his aid, she was left with the choice of finishing him off or saving Rex. She chose her longtime clone ally, and everyone survives. But as the siege carried on, he was eventually driven off Mandalore, and Bo-Katan becomes the regent of Mandalore. This was probably the best shot in their history at a stable government, with a balance of good military self-reliance embodied in a peace-craving ruler. But alas, it wasn't in Darth Sidious' playbook. During the Imperial Era, she was deemed traitorous and replaced with Clan Saxon, who was willing to do the Emperor's bidding. But there were some other holdovers. Fen Rao of the Protectors opposed Death Watch, and his Skull Squadron aided the GAR in various operations throughout the Clone Wars. Once Rao even helped to save the life of a young Kanan Jarrus. After the war, Palpatine allowed the Protectors to consolidate power in Mandalore space, with their main base being on a moon of Concord Dawn. Clan Saxon converted itself into Imperial Super Commandos, and in the year 2 BBY, they wiped out the Protectors. This ensured that his clan was the sole ruler of Mandalore, and that Palpatine's favor when it switched to Rao one day. Also that year, the Spectres discovered that Maul had been hiding the Darksaber on Dathomir. They recovered it, and encouraged Sabine Wren to start training with it. Knowing the immense responsibility connected to this weapon, she was reluctant, but the now rebel-aligned Fen Rao supported her. She returned to her clan stronghold, and tried to get her mother to join the rebellion. When Saxon arrives, there erupts an epic Mandalorian showdown that would make her ancestors proud. With the Darksaber in the hands of this sellout Mandalore, Sabine was required to fight with Ezra's lightsaber. She does win the day, and Saxon dies. But this of course now dragged Mandalore into another civil war, with Imperial allied Mandos versus those set on joining the Rebellion or remaining independent. Thrawn at this time was laying siege to Adalon, and when Ezra is able to escape, he got some of Sabine's allies to provide help. This cannot be overstated, but the Rebellion may have died this day if it wasn't for the Mando strike team destroying the Interdictor that was preventing Rebel ships from jumping to hyperspace. Without this opening, Thrawn would have certainly killed all that remained. Sabine then tried to offer the Darksaber to Bo-Katan, but she turned it down. This pair, along with other allied clans, tried to push the Empire off Mandalore, but the Duchess was unveiled. This prototype weapon was created by Sabine years before, when she was serving as an Imperial weapon designer. This insidious weapon draws arc energy to the Beskar alloy and the Mandalorian armor, allowing it to be used on the battlefield without hurting the Stormtroopers and their plastoid armor. Knowing how inextricably tied armor is to Mandalorian culture, and how the discovery of Beskar was a sign that Mandalore was the Promised Land, a material that was hoped to have kept them out of the timeless battles between the lightsaber-wielding Sith and Jedi, was now named after the Duchess, and used to vaporize Mandalorians on this Promised Land. Luckily, they were able to destroy this weapon, and seeing that her people were in serious need of a sole ruler, Bo-Katan accepted the Darksaber and became the new Mandalore. All this time, Jango's unaltered clone, Boba Fett, was rising to take on his father's mantle, becoming the top bounty hunter in the galaxy. But instead of coming back to fight for Mandalorian independence, he served the Empire as a hired gun. After the fall of the Empire, there was another badass who was known simply as the Mandalorian. His background and values are still unknown, but he is just another sign of the undying Mandalorian culture. With things like the sigil of the Mythosaur being seen in places like Maz Kanata's castle, and perhaps even the Mandalorian himself helping to finish the fight against the Emperor. The final Sith Emperor, the last in a long line of Sith that have plagued the Mandalorians for millennia. So that concludes the story of the Mandalorians. In a separate video, I'll cover behind the scenes facts, because those are deep and interesting on their own, and there's enough to make a full length video. I'll also cover weapons, ships, tech, and society in more detail later, so be sure to keep an eye out for those videos. If you want to connect with us on social media, find ways that you can help support this channel without it costing you a thing, or check out our Patreon. Be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, only two things are responsible for all the events in Star Wars history, the Force and the Mandalorians. And so the Force and the Mandalorians will be with you, always.